What's up, everybody? Welcome in. It's the Sooners on SI post game podcast coming at you live from not Jordan Hare Stadium's press box. We are in Who's Hotel Room. So, just real quick, if you're on the YouTube, there are no jokes you can't make that we've already made. That is the setup. <laughs> Uh, I am Ryan Chapman, managing editor at Sooners on SI. That is John Hoover, the publisher. Uh, who? What a damn football game we, we witnessed! Saw a good one, didn't we? Oklahoma escapes twenty-seven twenty-one. I think the great Tom Green said it best: Sooner magic greater than Jordan Hare voodoo. John, uh, you had the Kip Six. You had Michael Hawkins almost die live on the field for the second straight week. You had. Uh, an offense that didn't move the ball for two quarters, and somehow, some way, we looked up, and at the end, it was the pride of Oklahoma playing Boomer Sooner. It was chance of Michael Hawkins. There were BV chants, and uh, Oklahoma got their first SEC win, 27-21. Yeah, what a series of events to to unfold, especially at the end of this game. Uh, a lot happened before that led up to that moment or those moments uh, in the final eight minutes, eight-ish minutes, uh, certainly in the last four minutes. But, um, gosh, where do we start? Uh, Let's start at the end. The, Normally we would, we'd run through it, we'd do the offense, we'd do the defense, but yeah. I, I don't think you can really yeah. separate these two. It's the, it's the Kip Six. It's Sooner Magic. I mean, I'm, I'm down there on the field, right, in the final minutes. Uh, I beat everybody else down on the field somehow. Yeah. I kind of stumbled out of there early and got the heck out. Had a little escort take me right to where I needed to go. It was fantastic. And then I sat there for a good 10 minutes wondering how I was going to rewrite the story that I had already written, right? I, the story was written. Oklahoma, 0-2 in conference play. And, uh, nope, that's not how it unfolded. And, I, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, how am I going to? What's all these events? What's going to happen? It was Sooner Magic. Popped into my head. And I th I'm thinking, you know, I got this. I got this Sooner Magic. This is gonna, I got it. The lead is going to be Sooner Magic. I get in the press room for the post-game press conference. OU has already tweet, tweeted out when the game was over, Sooner Magic. Uh, Brent Venable said, that's my first taste of Sooner Magic as a head coach. I'm like, Okay, so everybody knows about this. It wasn't anything uh, original or unusual. So not just you. I did my best. Not just you. Uh, Bomani Jones, who uh, I always really enjoy his work at ESPN. He yeah. grew up a Texas fan. He literally tweeted after the game, paraphrasing, uh, just introduced this to the SEC. They call it Sooner Magic. It's annoying as hell. Was <laughs> Bomani Jones was from a Texas fan's perspective. No, I mean, you look at it, Hoove, and we, we are – here in the hotel in mm -hmm. Montgomery, because everyone has to clear out of the press box three hours after. So, so you know that, uh, magic yeah, you, you know that we don't get our stuff done early enough there. And but our conversation that was gonna be happening all the way back to Montgomery was about to be: we're gonna have to write some really uncomfortable articles about Seth Luttrell's future. Yep. We're gonna have to write some really uncomfortable articles about where this season is going. What is how many more losses is it going to take for Brent Middles to be on a hot seat? That kind of stuff. Eligible? Yeah, like yeah. like what what does the rest of the season look like? Because mm -hmm. when you look at the schedule, the two games Oklahoma has to win at Auburn, which feels like an insane statement to say, considering that even coming into the year, it was going to be Jackson Arnold's first start. It was obviously my hot first road start. It was Michael Hawkins Jr.'s first start, period. Yeah. And the other one in SEC play has got to be South Carolina. And you look at it. Michael Hawkins Jr. came out, very first drive, 48-yard house call, and everyone's going, that's the spark. It helped that Jake Taylor was coming back, so Oklahoma finally had their first-team offensive line. And, and then, man, the offense sputtered. Michael Hawkins didn't have the back-breaking error. He was 10 of 15 through the air, no interceptions, 161 yards. There was, like, an intentional grounding that was him trying to make a play. Like, the, the biggest negative against Michael Hawkins through the first three quarters is Hey, occasionally, I think he left the pocket a little bit early, but mm -hmm. he also other times had to literally evade out of sacks, all that stuff. And as the game was going, Oklahoma couldn't get any pressure on Peyton Thorne. Auburn was starting to move the football, and it was the Auburn we had talked about, right? This yep. is an offense that was explosive but led the country in turnovers. Oklahoma's going to have to force the turnovers. The turnovers weren't coming, and it was three big chunk plays through the air for Auburn. Two ended up being touchdowns, then one of them, the big Cam Coleman one that put him into the red zone when the fourth quarter flips, it comes around 21, 10. And, and we're sitting here who've going Oklahoma cannot score 21 points. That, yeah. That's not going to happen. Everything was written. 
And it was first a big time throw from Mike Hopkins taking the lid off the defense. Finally, a Finally. sixty yard bomb to JJ Hester. Where has that been? Fifth game. Where has that been? Yeah, it, it it has been totally non-existent. And then two plays later, Javante Barnes trucks it in. So now, for those keeping track at home, Hawkins has the largest run from scrimmage, that 48-yarder in the first half, first drive. The largest pass from scrimmage this year, that 60-yarder. But still, who Auburn gets the ball back. The Oklahoma defense was stranded on the field all day long. Auburn pops off a couple of runs. And finally, Oklahoma hadn't given up a 20-yard run all year. They get the 22-yard run. And I head to the elevator going down to the field thinking, yep. this thing is over, over, over. And I'm in the elevator with the OU Dailies, Gracie Rollins. We're just trying to get down there. You're already on the field. We're on the sixth level. We stop on the fourth level. It opens up. There's some concession stands crew that comes in. We hear this roar. And Gracie turns to me and says, ah, Auburn must have scored. And I was Sounds like, yep, like that's the Tigers it. Won. By the time we get down to level one, it is Kip Lewis, 63-yard pick six. And we're going, what the bleep yeah. is happening right now? And and uh, that's what totally turned this game on its head. Yeah, the long pass was uh, it was like a th- thunderbolt out of the blue. It was uh, we had no idea it was coming. You know, like I said, had, they haven't connected all year. Uh, Jaden Gibson was not open. Nick Anderson was not open. Dion Burks was not open. It was JJ Hester? JJ Hester with his biggest contribution as a Sooner. What's he been here? Three years? Yeah, three years. Biggest contribution as a Sooner. He had a nice catch, I think, in the first quarter. Is that right? Maybe first half. I can't remember. Uh, but he's running over guys and he's zipping, back, going back and forth like a pinballing, and he got the first down. It was a very impressive run, very impressive run after catch. And then he comes up with this 60 yarder with the game, not even on the line. It was like, oh, you was dead. They didn't have a pulse. They weren't doing anything offensively. They weren't threatening. But Hawkins lays a perfect ball out to him. He jumps out, catches the football down at the five yard line. Javante Barnes scores uncontested on the next play. And at that point, you look at the scoreboard and you're like, uh, 21-16, huh? Hmm, okay. Auburn's probably still going to win this thing, right? They go down and get a first down, I think, and then the, was it on third down? Uh, Peyton Thorne throws what we determined to be from the press conference, an RPO. He throws an RPO over the middle when you're trying to run the clock out. Uh, it was 21-16 at this time, and I'll be darned, Kip Lewis – with the Kip Six, brilliant uh, marketing by OU social media people. Again, mm-hmm. uh, I'm not taking credit for Kip Six. Kip Six belongs to OU social media team. So uh, that was impressive. He said, "I was just trying not to get caught." Yeah. Uh, his teammates were like, "Were like on their." I asked two different guys their perspective on the field, and he was like, "Just don't get caught by that offensive tackle." I knew he wasn't get caught by the offensive tackle, but a receiver chased him down right at the goal line, got in. And then Michael Hawkins with the absolute, what Brent Venables called a hero play, uh, starting to roll out, looking to throw it, looking to throw it, tucks it. And I said, oh, God, he's coming right at me. The whole team's going to be over here in five seconds. I kept my camera down here. I didn't shoot the video. But he hits the air and hits a defender and spins and goes into the end zone, two-point conversion. OU leads it. It was 24-21, but uh, it was 22-21 before that. I had, again, we had no idea that this was going to happen. Uh, and I asked Brent in the postgame press conference, I asked a couple of players as well. I uh, also asked Seth Luttrell, what evidence did you have that there was going to be this fourth quarter out of the blue thunderbolt, anything? And, you know, Brent was like, just keep fighting, just keep believing. Uh, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm trying to remember, who did I talk to? R. Mason Thomas, I think, told me that it was um, Kip Lewis. He would go to the sideline and say, we're getting a turnover right here. We're getting a turnover right here. He just kept going. He kept saying that. Next thing you know, Kip Lewis got the turnover and returned it for a touchdown. Unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, this thing was dead. I, it, it just going back through it, it's insane. So go. let's go back a couple drives before all the absolute chaos. Hawkins hit Bauer Sharp for mm-hmm. a big, huge 35-yard completion. That was after... Auburn had gone up 21 to 10, start of the fourth quarter, and you're thinking, okay, Oklahoma's in business. This this is it's now or never. See, I think I was in the elevator for that one. I yeah. That one. Yeah. And and that's where things kind of stalled a little bit. You had uh it was that, and then Barnes had a nine yard run. Then you had a holding penalty on Jake Roberts as Oklahoma's tight ends were terrible as far as penalties go, just penalties. 
Um, then after that, you had a false star, and that backed Oklahoma all the way up. One of the two sacks Mike Hawkins did take was on that fourth down. It set Auburn up near midfield. That's when the 22-yard run happened, and you're thinking, this thing's over. Auburn's chewing clock. O- like, I had writ the, written the heading in, in my takeaways that tired legs finally give out because that, that was the big question. Oklahoma's defense on the field for nine minutes in the second quarter, nine minutes in the third quarter. That was not going to go well. And then Auburn, for whatever reason, Hugh Freeze talking about after the game, having to coach up his players' better situational football, calls two RPOs. Yep. Thorne pulls it, goes incomplete, incomplete. And suddenly after they started with a 22-yard run. They're kicking a 50-yard field goal with their backup kicker, and they only ran a minute and a half off the clock. Yep. The kicker shanks it. That's when uh, they come around, and two plays later, uh, Hawkins hits the big 60-yard bomb. And, and uh, Look, it, it was still really, really ugly from Oklahoma offensively. We, we, in the first half – Reventable said so. Yeah, in the first half, they had 48 yards on the Michael Hawkins touchdown run. They had 63 yards, I believe, the entire rest of the first half. So it, it was clearly not great. Part of that is due to the fact that just simply they had to throw three tight end screens to Bauer Sharp because no more wide receivers yeah. were there. Like yeah. that, that was a forced thing that they had to do. But this is the same thing we saw with Mike Hawkins last week. And my big question was, okay, he was put into that Tennessee game where he's playing to show he should earn the starting job. And no one really expected Oklahoma to win that game when they were down 19-3. So he simultaneously was kind of playing with no pressure, and he just has to bring some kind of spark. Mm -hmm. What's that going to look like when you have the pressure of, if you go out there and make a mistake, you're the starter, you're you're playing the whole game? And I I thought, while it wasn't always perfect, we've talked about it. It's not just been Jackson Arnold. It's been a lot of other stuff that, is bad with the offense, but the turnover is what you couldn't accept. Right. I thought Hawkins was tough. Yep. He hung in there. He tried to make plays even when the plays weren't made. He was poised. He, and, and outside of the the only other time was that Petaway he was throwing too vertically in the third quarter and the ball was kind of put off on the sideline. Mm-hmm. It looked a little yep. bit like what Jackson yep. was throwing. Over, overthrown. Yeah, throwing deep balls. Other than that, I – I thought Hawkins was excellent considering yeah. everything else that was happening around. All the pressure that he faced and all the times that he just got out of the pocket and threw the football away and kept the drive alive, as opposed to how many times in college football have we seen a true freshman quarterback, well, I made this play in high school. I'm going to roll out here and I'm going to hang on to it and I'm going to wait till my receiver opens and I'm going to I'm gonna uh, shuck this guy and I'm going to stiff arm that guy. No, you always get knocked backwards when you're a quarterback out there trying to make plays, trying to make guys miss, trying to hold on to the play, trying to extend too long. He very had a lot of poise, uh, showed a lot of composure, and uh, would get out there and say, okay, nobody's open, throw it out of bounds. And he's gotten really good at that. A couple of his incompletions uh, against Tennessee were like that as well. He's um, he's very patient, and he, he's been drilled by you know his dad, former OU football player, Kevin Murray, who's Kyler Murray's dad and a quarterback trainer, uh, has been drilled by his high school coaches. If there's nothing there, check it down. If there's still nothing there, throw it away. And he's he's just, I mean, you got to appreciate that. He's not forcing, he's really not forcing anything. I don't, have we seen a, a really dumb throw from him yet in no, two games? No. Not yet. Not yet. Not through three halves of football. And this was in front of, uh, 85, 88,000 mm-hmm. fans at Jordan Hare, a place that in the SEC is considered voodoo. Yeah. Um, this is after. Look at the like they're big, 0 three against Power Five teams there this year. Though. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're they're like four and like fifteen in the last three. Like it, it's not an impossible place to play, but it is a tough atmosphere, and the fans yeah. are bringing it. Mm-hmm. And uh, because Oklahoma let them believe and let and let them be ahead, they, Auburn was thinking, "Oh my gosh, we're finally going to get a win." It's a ranked opponent, technically, all that stuff at the time. But just look at some of the stuff that went wrong, too, for a true freshman. Uh, he has a big play in the first half to Bauer Sharp that Jake Roberts, instead of just running his defender into Sharp's defender, Roberts actually clipped somebody and it, and it made it look really bad. Easy OPI coming back, just a, a play that was probably going to pop anyway if Jake Roberts doesn't do that. You talk about in the third quarter, yep. Oklahoma finally punches it in uh, from the three and then – Nope, nope, just kidding. Bauer Sharp went forward on his motion. So instead of a nice little great play call mm-hmm. from Seth Luttrell, few and far between, it feels like we've been able to like hold up and be like, this is a great play call. Yep. Great execution out from Hawkins and from Barnes. But instead, that gets caught off the board, pushes them back to third and seven. They then are unable to convert, have to kick the field goal. Shout out to Zach Schmidt for two field goals. We'll talk yep. about him here in a little bit. That's the kind of stuff that like a true freshman, we talked about it. They need to help this kid out. And 
Oklahoma's defense, whether it be giving up a third and 10 from the minus 25 on the second drive of the game, that's the one that Auburn went all the way down the field and Oklahoma got the goal line mm-hmm. stop. You talk about uh, there was another third down play that led to Auburn's first touchdown that they had them stopped at third and seven, unable to make the tackle, and suddenly it's it's uh, seven seven and fourteen seven. All of that stuff. It was not the ideal setup for a true freshman quarterback, and Hawkins didn't force anything. Was unfazed. I, I was just so impressed with the poise that he carried himself with. Yeah, uh, I, I was as well, and I was I was also impressed with the poise that Oklahoma's defense. Um, showed as well if i could transition to just in terms of uh, certainly ad- admiring the team and how they pulled together brent Venable said multiple times in the in the post game press conference came together in that fourth quarter and won this football game against all odds um what i liked about what the oklahoma defense did they gave up th- four passes of 30 yards or more three of them were 40 yarders uh two of those were touchdowns and they maintained their poise they didn't panic uh, guys were getting beat deep. We've seen that before. Um, is this defense elite? I think it's on the verge of being elite. But I think what we saw tonight was games on the line. R. Mason Thomas gets two more quarterback sacks. Uh, one of those was on fourth down. And games on the line, Kip Lewis gets a pick six. Uh, early in the game, you saw the first first drive, three and out. Second drive, missed a tackle on third down. That was, I think, Danny Stutzman missed the tackle on third down. They convert. They keep the drive alive. They get down to the goal line. Brent Venable said, an inch away like this uh, on the video, inch away. And uh, they stopped him twice on a fourth down uh, fourth down uh, goal line stop. Uh, the, so the defense had a lot go wrong, um, but at the same time, they overcame. And a lot of that stuff was self, self-inflicted. A lot of it was Auburn has a very talented offense. Yeah. They, their stuff was self-inflicted for the most part, and they overcame that. So poised by the offense, poised by the young quarterback, also poised by a, a veteran and talented defense. It's kind of weird to like sift through it because you look at it, Auburn went 4-14 four of 14 on third down. So you'd say, good job defense. But the problem is one of the massive ones ended up – it ended up being the goal line stand, but – that was a backbreaker because it put Oklahoma behind the entire rest of the first yeah. quarter in field position, basically, uh, which they couldn't really work their way out of. We talked about it. a couple of those other third downs ended up being on conversions and then touchdowns a couple of plays later. Uh, the real trouble, though, was really Auburn was good on first down. That's something that Brent Little's talked about after the game. 7.7 yards per play on first down, mm-hmm. which meant that Auburn obviously got to live in second and three, second and two. It's the same thing we talked about in that Tulane game. If they're living in second and three, second and two, Oklahoma has to respect the run a lot more. Finally, later in the game when Auburn either had to throw, or it's certainly those last two drives after Oklahoma went ahead, Peyton Thorne is backed up into obvious passing situations. Mm -hmm. We know Peyton Thorne is not going to thrive. The couple of times they got him the third and long, even before the fourth quarter, he had had the total miscommunication on – uh, the Auburn sideline in the third quarter that was a deep shot that I actually thought Cam Coleman roasted. Uh, it's like, can I walk her again? Can I walk her at a bad day? Yeah. Uh, and Peyton Thorne just throws it way out, the, all that stuff. But Oklahoma couldn't get them into third and long. When they got them in third and long, suddenly you see the sacks come, which is exactly the case against Tulane. So yeah. uh, really, really interesting what's happened there. I thought they really missed Kendall Dolby today. Yeah, I, I thought that this Auburn skill position group is a really, really tough one because – Woody Washington, I don't think, has played very well at Cheetah as far as he was kind of forgiven the first time uh, against Tulane because of that, be, for not being totally locked up in some of the coverages. But I, I thought he was just fine. Kai Walker got smoked again on some inside leverage stuff. Second week in a row, we've seen that. This is a good Auburn skill position group. Um, I mean, Oklahoma's going to see a ton of really good ones. Texas, Ole Miss, even though they lost today. Alabama, I don't know who's going to cover Ryan Williams on this team. The good news for Oklahoma is no one else has covered him. But I thought that Oklahoma went out there and pitched like a, a C plus or a B minus for most of the game on defense. And then it was an A plus right at the end when they needed it, which is a great sign that for a group in you look all the way back to 2022 that the story was they could play okay for three quarters and fade and fade and fade. This group's getting better and better in the fourth yeah. quarter, which is something Britt Venables talked about being proud of. Yeah, uh, he got the question about um, a defense that you can be proud of, basically. And he used the words in some, I can't remember the exact combination, what the exact quote is. Maybe you have it in the, in the quote sheet. But uh, 
he used the words, uh, people are laughing at you. He's talking about his defense from two years ago. He's also talking about the Oklahoma defense from 2012 and 2015 and 2018 and 2017 and 2019, right? People are laughing at the Oklahoma defense. Uh, like I said earlier uh, on the uh, stand-up at the end of the game from the Hedges, uh, people aren't laughing now uh, at the Oklahoma defense. And one of the one of the reasons, I mean, look at some of these numbers. I want to give you this. Uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma had 11 first downs. Auburn had 26. Total yards, total offense. Oklahoma had 291 yards, total offense. Auburn had 482. And here's, a, here's an example of that poise that I was talking about. Uh, Billy Bowman. Um, was interviewing him after the game, and, and you know, I was telling him, I was asking about where the defense has come in the last three years, how far it's come in the last three years, and he said, um, he said, you know, we, we look up at the scoreboard and we see that you know Auburn's a great team, a great offense, they've put up big numbers. He said this, this is this was funny to me. He said, you know, they had like 300 yards offense. Uh, they probably had more than 300 yards. They might have even had 400 yards. In case you weren't listening just now, Auburn had 482 total yards. Auburn was moving the football up and down, uh, especially in the uh, between the 20s. But what do they do? They rise up. They make plays at the end of the possession. They keep them out of the uh, end zone. They force field goals. They get third down stops. They get pick sixes. They get sacks on fourth down. This Oklahoma defense is, is pretty clutch. Yeah, it, it's been – Basically, what I'm saying, like, Billy – in his mind, he's thinking, geez, did, did they have 300 yards? I mean, did did we seriously give up 300 yards against this team? Yeah. That's what Billy's thinking. No, man, it was 500. But in his mind, he's thinking, we've had a pretty good day. We've we've been pretty productive. We've uh, stayed on top of things. It was almost 500. Not, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you kept him out of the end zone is the main thing. Yeah, it's just really funny. Britt Vittles was talking about it. Something that clearly has motivated this group for the last three years is yeah. – uh, flipping the script is is that's what Brent Venables said. Uh, not being something quote that people make fun of or laugh at. Who doesn't mm-hmm. like tough, physical, consistent, passionate defense? Can be the heart, heartbeat of a locker room. They showed a lot more good than not. And Brent Venables was that was part of a larger question about it wasn't perfect today, but they're getting closer and closer and closer. And yeah, it, it's it's we saw one or two moments of Danny Sussman getting dragged backwards or the yeah. pile getting dragged yeah. backwards. And it's just jarring that that was common two years ago. Yeah. And today when it was happening, we were going, that doesn't look right. That doesn't Billy look Bowman good. got blocked off his feet tonight. Did you see that? Oh my yeah. God. Yeah. Like that was the thing for the last 15 years is your safety comes up to support the run and gets blocked off his feet. Now it happens once in a game and you're like, wow, that's shocking. Because it, it is shocking. It the, Tonight's stat sheet looks a lot more like something we were used to talking yeah. about. Billy Bowman, your leading tackler with eight total tackles. Spears Jennings, Woody Washington, Kobe Kinsey with six total tackles. It wasn't like the, it's a lot of the secondary, right? And a lot of that was because Arvin played at the second level. It mm-hmm. wasn't a Danny Stutzman 15 tackle performance. Not because Dan, not because like with um, Kenneth Murray getting dragged to the second level against Army. Yep. It was because Danny Stutzman's living in the backfield stuff like that. That's not what you had tonight. But they came up big. They got the eight tackles for loss. They got the four sacks. They got obviously. The, uh, the interception, it, it was everything you want from Oklahoma defense, and and I thought it was incredibly impressive too because it was a storyline we talked about all week. In the second and third quarter, the offense was stalling. Was the defense going to gamble and try to overcompensate for the offense and end up making a poor play because they were trying to make a spectacular play? Instead, Brent Venables, go to Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com or head over to Hoover's YouTube page, John Hoover Media. Be sure you watch Brent Venables talk about what Kip Lewis went through yep. on that final pick. This when is he saw where his eyes were. Yeah, because basically Brent Venables said, you know, it's a zone blitz where you're trying to get a free guy. So what does Kip Lewis, the first thing he has to do is sell that he's coming. And then once the offensive lineman goes, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, then Kip Lewis can back off. And that creates the free blitzer, which created the pressure, which meant the Peyton Thorne had to throw it quickly. The Oklahoma defense of three years ago, Kiplis would have just started backpedaling. Yep. Peyton Thorne would have never felt pressure because the offensive line would have picked it up. He probably would have picked him apart, not just for four yards, but for 24 yards on a third down, game over, bada bing, bada boom. Thanks for coming out. Enjoy your trip to the Plains. All, all that stuff. That's not what you got. So I thought that was incredibly impressive. Uh, when you look at it, who've 
Some of the final stats here, Hawkins 10 of 15 for 161. On the offensive side of things, he added 69 yards on the ground and a score. Javante Barnes had 18 carries for 61 yards and a score. I thought Javante was pretty good. Bauer Sharp, 43 did, yards. Does any other running backs carry the football? No. I've got zero carries for zero yards by the entire running back staff, except for Javante Barnes, who came in today and carried the whole workload yeah. out of the backfield. And obviously no Taylor Tatum today. He was ruled out on the availability report. Believed to be concussion protocol after that Tennessee game. We'll see. Then you look there, and, and the 10 catches, four of them for Sharp, three of them for Hester, two for Brennan Thompson, who I thought had two really oh. tough runs. I, it was just a – it was, a, what, two 15-yarders on the dot. I thought Brennan Thompson was really, really tough today. Yeah. By the way, only the one catch for two yards. It, it's not going to blow your socks off here's by any the, means. Here's the yak numbers. 30 yards receiving for Brennan Thompson, 25 yards after catch. Because he's knocking people over. That was impressive. Yeah. He has been in the weight room. Yeah, he has. And, <laughs> and you look at it, and again, that second quarter, Oklahoma only gets 34 yards. Third quarter, Oklahoma only gets 61 yards. But then they matched Auburn blow for blow, 119 and 119 in the fourth quarter. Obviously, the turnovers help. And, and it, it leads us – we'll talk about special teams here in a second because it was a big weapon. But there's a lot that Oklahoma's going to fix during the bye week. Offensively, not everything's magically solved, anything like that. But at least you have some momentum, and they finally have one or two pieces of things that are good, whether it be the fact that the offensive line that started today is technically the offensive line that's, that was their week one, quote-unquote, starting group on the depth chart. Another week where I don't know if they'll get healthier, per se, because they're going to still be hitting and practicing really hard, but maybe they can manage that a little bit better, get some chemistry there. You had that. You finally have a deep pass or two, and they have to hope that they can get Deion Burks, and whether that is getting Jacoby Johnson more up to speed or getting more faith in these freshmen. The next game on Oklahoma's schedule is Texas. It's not going to be a game where they're going to be able to do the typical, like, hey, you short the rotations and rely on the veterans, because yeah. all, all they've got are really young pieces on offense, it feels like. I'll be interested to see, did Jacoby Johnson get any reps at wide receiver today? I, I didn't remember seeing him at all. I didn't either. Which, to be fair, Brent Venables quite literally said it in the side on Tuesday, paraphrasing, don't expect him to play some massive role yeah. this week. That was a move made for the next eight mm -hmm. games, not the next one game. We had talked about it. It's a cautionary tale to expect a guy who has been working 0% of the time with the offense to get thrown out there. I was a little surprised there wasn't a single moment of, hey, we can throw a screen that way, mm -hmm. or hey, we can maybe, maybe they think Jacoby's going to be used on a screen. Mm -hmm. to have, I'm, I'm a little surprised there, but Seth Luttrell's not been the most creative this year, so I, that maybe that was on us. But it, it, was, it was a simplified game plan. Here's another thing I thought I noticed. Who, you tell me if you saw this differently. Oklahoma did a really good job, first, second quarter especially, of getting to the line of scrimmage with 25-ish yeah. seconds. And I, I don't know if Seth was asked about this post game. There was a lot of other stuff with the two point conversion play, the pick six, something maybe to go back. It looked like they would have one play call and then they would check down into something else, which to me, I, I would love to be able to ask. And again, there was so much going on post game. It was the most hectic post game I think I've ever been a part of with the time limit. Um, I would like to know if that was Seth Luttrell saying, instead of doing the RPO, I'm going to call one thing. And then I'm going to look at it pre-snap. Mm -hmm. And if I have to, I will force them to check into the other one. Because it didn't feel like there was a big – Michael Hawkins was talking with his offensive line more yep. than I ever noticed Jackson Arnold talking with him. And it just felt like there were none of the miscommunications, all, all that mm -hmm. stuff that really, really – like did Oklahoma get beat physically? Did Jake Taylor get driven back a couple times? Absolutely. But it didn't feel like this was just – Three guys left, right, and center. And I wonder if that was part of stuff that Charles simplifying things and saying, okay, we can't really totally take out the RPO because yeah. I want to have both those looks in there in case. But I sure as can tell my quarterback in his helmet, we're checking out and we're just handing the ball off. I'll be eager to hear what uh, Gabe Eichert's take on this is. As a former uh, offensive lineman, All-American offensive lineman, he usually has great takes on what the offensive line is supposed to do and what they actually do. Uh, and usually there's a big disconnect, or usually I should say there has been at times in the past a few weeks a big disconnect. So, um, but what I think the point you're making, and I, I'd, I'd like to hear somebody expound on that, whether it's Seth or Brent or, or somebody observing it like us, um, simplifying not just the RPO stuff, but maybe you take the RPO stuff out, what Brent said in his post-game press conference last Saturday night, hand the damn ball. If it's a running play, just hand the damn ball, handing the damn ball. Um, maybe they took the RPO element 
out to some degree. I think they also simplified the protections. If this guy comes is shading in this area, or if you see a three technique on the nose or uh, on the inside eye or something like that, or you see a nose shading off on the outside, you know they're going to do this. You know their tendencies are to this. And uh, I just got the feeling that there were there were almost no protection busts in terms of there were guys like you said getting pushed back, but there was no um, you know just whiffs. Uh, and I shouldn't say no. There were a couple. But there was no uh, way less noticeable way, way less than the first yeah, four weeks than the first four because weeks, it, especially Tennessee last week. Tennessee really exposed um, some shortcomings in Oklahoma's offensive line, uh, the way they deploy guys, the way they slide protect or the way they shift their protection, uh, depending on where the pressure is coming from. Tennessee absolutely exploited that. I thought uh, Auburn's defense tonight was defensive line man on man. I thought Auburn's defensive line was better. But in terms of one unit protected, five guys, for six guys protecting the quarterback, I thought Oklahoma's front line was better than Auburn's deep defensive line. Yeah. It, it, because it was, of that communication element. Only ended up allowing two sacks and two quarterback hurries. And yep. one of those sacks was on that fourth and ten. We were talking about that Hawkins was always going to hold the ball a little bit longer mm-hmm. because he was going to be trying to make something happen there. So, yeah, I, I'm I can't wait to circle back and ask that. Uh, I don't know how much media we've got this week. Would it be in the bye I week? I think zero. Yeah, usually it's been zero, but next time it's something we're going to write down because it might have been as simple as we're going to run a pass play out of this formation unless I give you the kill, kill, kill. Then from and then Seth Luttrell is going to from the box. He's going to take the decision out of the true freshman's hands. Yeah. Seth Luttrell is going to count. Seth Luttrell is going to read the defense. And Seth Luttrell is going to say, kill, kill, kill. We're handed Javante Barnes, and you're going power right or power left or zone mm-hmm. right or zone left, whatever it was. I, I thought that was that version of that. It's what Oklahoma fans have asking for. I thought it was good. I thought it was good. So you got that. Two other guys that we have to talk about here before we kind of spin this into the bye week, Uh Number one, Luke Elzinga, punter. <laughs> absolutely fantastic tonight for Oklahoma. The Sooners, from the moment that they got that fourth down stop, they were going to lose the field position battle the yep. entire f- rest of the first half until someone scored a touchdown. Right. Like That was how that was going to be because they didn't get the safety, right? But we knew that they weren't going to be able to really probably string three or four first downs together to get Oklahoma out of it. Elzinga averaged 47.6 yards per punt on five punts. Two of his punts went for more than 50 yards. Two of his punts were down inside the 20. The one that he shanked really had a chance to pin Auburn back deep too, but it it still landed inside the 20. So if you're going to shank it, still landed inside the 20. Yeah, Yeah. it it was fantastic work by Luke Elzinga. And he's he's been a weapon for OU Hoop. And while the offense, I think, showed some incremental improvements here and there that they're going to have to build on, we'll talk about all that. Luke Elzinga is going to have to be a weapon the whole rest of the year for Oklahoma, and I think he will. I think he will. He's their most consistent player right now. He's the guy that – think about this. You you count on – you know, you go through practice and you train and you do all your individual drills and you do all your team drills and you do all your – he is the guy. He is the one guy that when they ask him to do something, he does it exceptionally well. You think, oh, God, that's that's where our team is. The, the team is best player as a punter. When you're playing a field position game, when you've got an experienced defense and an inexperienced offense, I think it's okay for the punter to be the best player on the team when he flips the field like that. Yeah, it, it's big Shout time. Other great players on the team like Danny Stutzman, Billy Bowman, obviously, but he's the guy that he's the guy that does – he's the one guy that does the thing that you ask him to do every time. Yeah, he's been excellent. He's been a, a huge weapon. Another guy who is excellent today – First off, on kickoffs, Zach Schmidt, this is a dangerous Auburn return team. Their skill position players are legit. That's the one place that I think when you take over a program and Hugh Freeze can recruit and Auburn's got the NIL backing, I think the fastest place you can make up ground is at your skill positions. It's Mm -hmm. the lines of scrimmage, everything else that comes along slower. That also helps your kick return game. He was great there. But Zach Schmidt, what a spot for him to be in, right? Everything that we have all said all off season that, that some of us have said for two years is I really don't care how well Zach Schmidt can kick uh, in practice. He clearly can't do it in a big time moment, a big time game. Yep. Zach Schmidt called into action with Tyler Keltner on the shelf for a week with, with his kind of emergency situation rolls out there in the third quarter who in a massive spot. I know it was just a 24 yard field goal, but massive spot after you saw the kicker on the other sideline have the heebie jeebies all game long, absolute nails, 
Then he rolls back out there again. Oklahoma's up 24-21. If you can kick the field goal, if you can make it 27-21, then Auburn has to score a touchdown with no timeouts. It changes everything. 39-yarder, and I turned. I was standing by Aber and Gracie, and I was like, there's no shot. This this is not happening. There's no shot. are against it. And he just absolutely crushes it through. Just hats off and take about a Zach Schmidt. What a wild spot for him to be in, and what a performance from him. I know it wasn't banging 50 yarders or anything like that, but I thought Zach Schmidt was absolute nails, and it's a guy that's taken it on the chin for two straight years, from me included. I agree. Me too. Uh, What was the score tonight? Uh, 27-21. I believe that's a six-point win. Six points? And how many field goals did he make? I think he made two. Two. Each one was worth three points. I, I think three points. Okay, so that sounds like six. Yeah. Plus three equals six. So they won by the margin of Zach Schmidt tonight. Big time. Good job. Great job, young man. You're on the, the Campbell Award watch list, the academic Heisman. And uh, you are uh, going to go down in OU lore as, part of, uh, as a big part of one of the uh, best games, most entertaining games, most exciting games, uh, sooner magic games that we've ever seen. It's uh, He provided the final margin. Yeah, I mean, there are two cornerstone wins of the Brent Mimbles era so far. Texas a year ago, mm-hmm. this game. And this game is going to be massive. We're going to talk about it spinning forward. Real quick, I want to give you a, a couple other names real quick that I thought played well defensively before we roll into the bye week. That Kobe McKenzie was – Maybe he was a little more overshadowed by Kip Lewis's pick six and by Danny Stutzman and, and how Danny just had an off day for Danny. Danny was still good today, I thought, but it was not the the high standard we're used to from Danny. Uh, it doesn't necessarily show up with the, the six tackles, one sack, one tackle for loss. Uh, Kobe also had the, the SWAT pass breakup, which watching that over and over again, Kobe had to take a step forward because he thought the offensive line was coming forward. Then he... By the time he looked up, the ball was right on his face. I said, it could have been a pick, but I think that was a really hard play because he was trying to carry out his assignments in the running game. I thought Kobe McKinnon's really good. The only thing we saw this guy in the first half, I thought Caden Woolard was excellent for the little bit of run he got in the first and second quarter. He was disrupted off the edge. He had another pass breakup. He kind of was uh, – I don't think it rose to the level of getting a quarterback hurry, but he was in the vicinity of making Peyton Thorne uncomfortable, yep. made some good tackles. I, I thought he was really, really good he, for a couple of quarters there. He hurried Peyton Thorne's internal clock Yeah, a couple of times. Uh, so did Ethan Downs. Those guys up front batted down three passes uh, as a group. And that's – boy, that's a, that's a lot. Uh, one time it looked like Peyton Thorne was trying to throw the ball through a guy. I think it was uh, Ethan Downs was Ethan- coming right at him. And he just like threw it in his face. Yeah, Ethan had that one, and then Caden Woolard basically blew up a screen. Like it, it was, it Caden was so on top of it that it was uh, if Peyton Thorne, I think, was so worried about him that he threw a bad ball. If he had thrown a quote unquote good ball to where the screen was going, it would have been a pick six for, or at least an interception for Caden Woolard. So mm-hmm. I thought he was really, really good uh, in his first two. Was there anybody else that stood out or? R. Mason Thomas? R. Mason, we talked oh about it. R. Mason, he was excellent. Robert Spears Jennings, excellent yep. uh, as well. But now that, that sets Oklahoma off into this bye week. Trace and, Ford had the swipe. Yeah, Trace Ford did. did another swipe sack. Uh, not, well, I don't think it was a sack. It ended up being a forced fumble. Yeah. It was uh, pretty, pretty incredible stuff for uh, Oklahoma that they could have been going to the bye week and we would have been talking about are they going to make a coordinator change, yeah. all this stuff. And now suddenly – Again, the offense was far from perfect, but it's always easier to win, uh, to learn off the winning tape than lose. Uh, blah, 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 yeah. Coach speak, all that stuff. And it really feels like this defense, they were dominant through three weeks. They were really, really good. It's hard to say dominant against Tennessee because uh, Tennessee won the game, mm-hmm. but they were really, really good against Tennessee. This was by far their worst game. They only gave up 21 points. They yep. scored six points themselves, and they did everything they needed to in the fourth quarter to yeah, put up a clutch. winning position. It, it was uh, – if that's your worst game, every coach in the country will take that no, defensively. I, I agree completely with what you're saying here because you go into the, the open date and you're four and one and you know what's next. You've got number one ranked Texas. They're they've got an open date as well next week. Uh, and you know, that game's always we've said it a million times, that game's always a coin toss. Doesn't matter who's ranked, doesn't matter who's unranked, who's got a winning record, who's got a losing record, doesn't matter because the the winning team the team with the better record, the team with the higher ranking wins more often, but this is one of those series that you can literally check that off. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because um, they hate each other so much. The fans, 
the administrators, except for Josie and Chris Del Conte, <laughs> they kind of like each other. Uh, the coaches um, recruiting against each other. The recruits who were not recruited by Texas hate Texas. The recruits who went to Texas think they're better than OU, and they uh, they hate OU. It's so much fun, and it's one of those series that uh, it's a coin toss. And so I guess where I'm going with this ramble is you come out of this game that you should probably have very well lost. We've talked about it in the preseason as a this is one of those games that's going to determine left or right, you know, up or down. This is going to determine Oklahoma season. There's a couple more games down the line that are going to determine the season. But now you go into your big rivalry game off some real momentum. You've proven that you can win uh, in a difficult situation against a decent team on the road, making clutch plays, overcoming adversity, all that stuff. You've proven that you can do that with um, somebody like Auburn. At Auburn, again, 88,000 angry Auburn fans. It's going to be a little different. Obviously, we know that when there's 90,000 in the Cotton Bowl and it's... Javante Barnes said after the game... It's going to be so hard. It, it, well, but you're more uh, optimistic because of what you did today. You're more optimistic going into the Texas game. Yeah. Javante Barnes said uh, he was asked if it's the loudest stadium he's ever been in. He said the Cotton Bowl is the loudest stadium I've ever been in. But this was second. Yeah. Um, here's what I think really matters. We saw a ton in the 2010s. Oklahoma should have, mm. on paper, dominated Texas along both lines of scrimmage, and the series went back, uh, not totally back and forth, but Texas was able to pop up in a couple of those spots, mm. win some of those games they shouldn't have had any business winning, even though they were getting out most of the line of scrimmage. With what Hawkins did today, and Danny talked about it after the game, Javante talked about it after the game, the helicopter two-point mm -hmm. conversion play, it's cliche. It sounds dumb. That's the kind of stuff that a football sideline, football players, a locker room, they respond to. They that. love that stuff. And and that that's a guy that you know. Danny Sussman said he's a guy we believe in. Javante Barnes said a guy that was fearless, a guy we believe in. And and not that it was like a knock on Jackson. That's not how any of that was intended. Was called him the hero. Yeah, it's you can't go into a rivalry game where you're going to be the underdog mm -hmm. and you're going to be outmatched when you talk about. Texas defensive line, Oklahoma's offensive line. You can't go in and win that game if you don't believe that your quarterback can't get yeah. it done. And Oklahoma is going to come out of this thing going, we believe that Michael Hawkins Jr. is not going to make the catastrophic mistake. At some point he will, yeah. but we haven't seen it through through six halves or three halves of football, yeah. six quarters. There's they're going to go in saying this is a guy that's going to lead us. We know he's going to fight for every yard. Like in the in it's going to the defense is going to say. Don't freak out. Let it come to you. When it happens, it's going to happen. You know what yeah. I mean? Like it, all of that is what has to happen and has to be pounded into their head over the next 13 days if they're going to go in and pull an upset in the Cotton Bowl. Bottom line is there's a new energy with this team right now. Guys are starting to get a little healthier. Quarterback's starting to play a little better. Offensive line's coming together. Uh, I still don't know what's going to happen with the receivers. Maybe a week off will uh, we'll actually bring guys off the IR. I hey. Don't know. They, they got to get Burks back. Yeah. Farouk and Gibson not walking back nope. through that door. Nope. Nope. I don't expect Andrew, Andrew Lansing to play. Nope. And I, at this point, don't expect Dick Anderson to play the rest of the year. Probably so. I, I know it's I a quad. Maybe you can move on without those guys now. I know it's a quad situation, but I, I just it doesn't sound like that's – if you get him back, great. But I'm, I will not be, like, checking that on as something. So you're really talking about Burks' health and Taylor Tatum's health. Those yep. are the two guys that Oklahoma's offense was missing today. Get those back. What can Jacoby John can Jacoby Johnson play some snaps for you? But also, it's a big spot for Zion Kearney, Carry On, uh, JJ Hester. Can he take this momentum? Can that spur him on to being a, a practice superstar the next thirteen days? So he's a bigger part of the game plan because JJ Hester. Yeah, it, it's it's gonna have to be a thing. It, it's not all, something you expect. Yeah, but he's but, one of those X factors. You go to Auburn, you're down by eleven in the fourth quarter. Hey, let's throw it to JJ Hester. Right? That's what this team's thinking. Why yeah. not? So, yeah, a new energy, a new kind of vibe on this team right now. It'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. There's still a ton of work to do for Oklahoma. Still a ton of work to do for us. Head to Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com where you can read what I wrote about Kip Lewis. You can read what I wrote about Michael Hopkins. You can read my takeaways. You can read Hooves. Everything you need to know. It's the most comprehensive game recap, and we have it always for you. Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com after every single game. You can also – Watch all the post-game videos. Those will be up here as we get this going in the next 24 hours. 
or go to his YouTube page, John Hoover Media. All the post-game videos are up there as well. Then on Sunday, guess what? Hoover's driving. We're at Montgomery. We're headed back to the 918 where my car is parked, but I will be in the back seat churning stuff out all Sunday long, uh, check in with all the schedule stuff, all that fun stuff, the poll report, all that, but I will continue to be churning and burning. I'm sure I'm going to be writing about Zach Schmidt. I'm sure I'm going to be writing about Army Stop. There's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of content. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it'll all be spilling over. So don't and you don't worry. Don't use it all Sunday, Monday because we got like all week. I, with that no is interviews. true. We do have a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm probably just going to do everything that I can and then be like, all right, guys, it's over to you. I'm taking a couple of days off. But we shall see. We all see. need. The open date fell at a perfect time. Yes. For the team and the sports writer. Yes, it did. But don't worry. Everything that happens across the open date, all that stuff, Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com as we start to ramp our coverage back up in because it's a bye week. But it's the best kind of bye week, Hoob, because, you know, it's a bye week before Texas week, which means you get that energy a little bit more going and going and going. Uh, and I can't wait. I can't, I'm expecting chaos because all we did today was watch absolute chaos. If you just only watched the SEC on ABC <laughs> offerings today, you got Ole Miss and Kentucky, which was a thriller that Kentucky yeah. survived. You got Oklahoma erasing an 11 point fourth quarter deficit. You got everything that was Georgia Alabama 28 0, 30 to 7. Georgia's ahead, Alabama's ahead, interception, all that fun stuff. That was just the SEC slate on ABC, one channel. Uh, college football is absolutely delivering this year and can't wait. But uh, we've been rambling. It is now almost midnight for a 2.30 kick. That's pretty standard for us. But good. as always, OklahomaSoonersOnSI.com. That's the website for all the content. For the podcast, we'll be back on Thursday. Um, no opponent preview, probably. I'm sure. Look, I'll think all day tomorrow. We'll have a special guest. They'll join us. You'll find out on Thursday when who probably finds out who the guest is. But we'll talk to you on Thursday on the podcast. Uh we have fall ball softball this Wednesday. I, that, just, that just occurred to me. So Wednesday night, I'll be out at Love's Field. So look out for that as well. The perfect bye week content. But other than that, we'll have tons of football. Obviously, you know us. We don't stop. Oklahoma Sooners on SI.com. But for the publisher, the man in charge, John Hoover, I'm Ryan Chapman signing off from this here hotel room in Montgomery, Alabama. We'll talk to you guys on the podcast next Thursday.